from Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 32, recorded on February 27, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. Today, we're going to follow up last week's episode with part two of RFK Jr. Targets the Amish. And as you write, uh, in July of 2021, RFK Jr. went to Lancaster Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, in the heart of the COVID pandemic, to scare the Amish away from life-saving vaccines. So what did he tell this audience? And who who was in the audience anyway? So Lancaster County is home to a large Amish population, uh, so the so-called plain people population. And so now sort of a year and a half into the pandemic, um, seven months into the availability of a vaccine, when thousands of people are dying of COVID every day, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. stands in front of a group of 1,500 people using the platform of a very famous name and proceeds to tell this group that vaccines aren't tested for safety. And the reason they're not tested for safety is because there's no placebo control group. Therefore, how could you know whether or not something is safe if you don't have the right control? Now, the vaccine had been out for seven months. It was tested um, in two large clinical trials. The first, Pfizer's, was a 40,000-person prospective placebo-controlled trial with salt water or saline as the placebo. The second was Moderna's 30,000-person prospective placebo-controlled trial. The safety follow-up was the safety follow-up for all vaccines, which is two months after the last dose. So he completely misrepresented those data. It, at a time when thousands of people were dying every day, and then we know now in retrospect, 300,000 people died because they chose not to get a vaccine. I just find that so incredibly egregious. And it, it amazes me that people like RFK Jr. are never held accountable for that kind of activity. So you mentioned that there was two months of safety follow-up, but actually after it's uh, distributed, the safety checking goes on longer, right? Years. I mean, it's, it's, in many ways, there are systems in place for vaccines that really should be in place for drugs. Uh, The so-called vaccine safety data link allows one to, in real time, do the so-called rapid cycle analysis where you can see who's gotten a vaccine and who hasn't based on these linked computerized medical record systems. So if there's a problem, you'll see it, you'll pick it up very quickly. I think had that been in place for say a drug like Vioxx, you would have picked it up as a rare cause of of, of specifically heart attacks much quicker. Um, So, and the reason it's, it's it's on the vaccine side is because you give vaccines to healthy people, including healthy children. So you wanna make sure that you have that, hold that to the highest standard of safety. So uh, he's just flat out wrong. Uh, my question to him would be, do you know you're wrong? Because, I mean, certainly the data were there. The, it's not like those data were hidden. I mean, it was in the newspapers or in, on the Internet all over the place. When, when that, that was probably the most watched event was December of 2020 when those vaccines rolled out. Well, he said all vaccines are not tested with a placebo. So it, even if he weren't aware of the, the COVID vaccine trials, he certainly could find information on other vaccines, right? Of course. I mean, famously, the the Salk polio vaccine in 1950s was placebo controlled, much to Salk's chagrin, right? Right, and and much to the, those who got the, the placebo were much more likely to suffer paralysis or death than those who got the vaccine. He then went on to say something about the the hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, tell us about that. Right. So he he wheels out these just typical anti-vaccine tropes that have been out there for decades, which is he argues that the hepatitis B vaccine is really only d- designed for people who, in his words, promiscuous gay men, prostitutes and drug users. Sort of gets it's kind of it's like a dirty vaccine. I mean, not anything you would normally give your children. He said that, you know, the, the government or the companies that made this vaccine, the hepatitis B vaccine, had trouble selling it. And so they went to the CDC and said, look, we're not selling this vaccine. We need to give it to have it as a routine childhood vaccine. 
And so then, you know, it was made a routine childhood vaccine in the early 1990s. And what ended up happening, there was a dramatic increase in SID, sudden infant death syndrome or crib death. So all of that is wrong. First of all, the the, uh, the the hepatitis B vaccine, the original hepatitis B vaccine, the so-called serum-derived vaccine, was introduced in the early 1980s. Um, it was derived, as its name suggests, from serum. So using blood from people uh, in the early 1980s was kind of a frightening prospect because that's when AIDS, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, came into this country. Now, the way that vaccine was made, which was a, a series of three um, chemical treatments with formaldehyde, uh, pepsin, and urea, no virus would have survived that, nor did HIV, or could HIV have survived that. But in any case, it sort of casts a, a pall over that vaccine. And so it wasn't very well used, even though it was initially recommended basically for, for high-risk groups. Um, then when, when we had the recombinant DNA vaccine come out in the early 1990s, we, we had sort of more data on this disease in children. So what you knew is that, that um, in the, by the early 1990s, about, uh, about 18,000 cases of hepatitis B occurred in children less than 10 years of age. And it's not because they were drug users. It's not because they were having promiscuous sex as gay men. And it's not because they were prostitutes. It's because these people less than 10 years of age, half of them acquired that virus while passing through a birth canal that had that virus in it because the mother was infected. But the other half got it from relatively casual contact in the home, say, sharing toothbrushes or having uh, because this virus is is, uh, is a sort of silent epidemic, because many people who have hepatitis B don't know it, that having, you know, having Uncle Bob, who has chronic hepatitis B, but doesn't know it, you know, kiss the child or whatever. So uh, 18,000 cases a year in children less than 10 years of age. And so the government in, in the early 1990s recommended a hepatitis B vaccine for children, which now has been out for 30 years and has dramatically, dramatically lowered the instance of this disease. And you want to get the hepatitis B vaccine early because if you get hepatitis B, like in passing uh, through the birth canal on the mother, if you get it at that early age, you're much more likely to go on to develop cirrhosis, which is chronic liver disease or liver cancer. Regarding his, his comment about crib death, if you actually look, or sudden infant death syndrome, if you actually look at the data, you would conclude the opposite was true. Because what happened in the early 1990s when the, uh, the CDC recommended this uh, vaccine, the hepatitis B, B vaccine for, for, you know, for, um, for infants and young children, the, um, the, they also launched something called the back to sleep program because children are much more likely to develop sudden infant death syndrome if they sleep on their uh, stomach than if they sleep on their back. So what you see in the, starting in the early 90s is a dramatic decrease in the instance of sudden de death syndrome, a dramatic increase in hepatitis B vaccine, and a dramatic decrease in the instance of hepatitis B. So he gets it. It's not just that he gets it wrong. He gets it completely wrong, almost like to the level of parody. He mentioned, <clears throat> well, in your column, you, you say that um, he, he said, when I was a child, I never heard of sudden infant deaths, as if what he remembers is of any consequence. Right. Sudden infant death syndrome existed even before RFK Jr. was a child. Now, as you say at the end of the article, he's running for president. And whether he gets nominated or not, he's going to have a large platform for his disinformation campaign. What can we do about this? Well, ironically, very early on when he launched his campaign for president, he said, you know, it's really, I'm not going to talk about vaccines. I mean, that's not what I'm, I'm going to talk about other things that are important for the American public. Then he proceeds to hire Del Bigtree, who's the head of a virulent anti-vaccine group called Informed Consent Action Network, as his communications director. So let's assume that that was wrong. Um, so now he has a much bigger platform to, to distribute his misinformation, but he's always had a big platform. The name Robert F. Kennedy is, is a name that inspires trust, especially among the African-American community, who I think are especially vulnerable to his targeting. I mean, he's created a, a movie um, called Vaxxed, which specifically, there's like a Vax 1, there's a Vax 2, and there's other uh, movies that he's been involved in that specifically targets African-Americans because his is a name African-Americans trust. I've asked you this before, but I need to ask you again. What is his motivation for spreading this misinformation, which, uh, as you illustrated last time with the Samoan measles outbreak, can claim lives? So what I would like to have happen, if fantasies could come true, I would like him to take a lie detector test and answer the questions about whether he really believes what he's saying. Um, 
Because one of two things is possible. Either one, he doesn't believe it, and he's just an advocate for a position independent of whether the facts contradict him. Or two, he does believe it, contrary to all existing evidence, which would be even weirder. In which case he should not hold any office. Right. It's most rational people, when they have a view and they're shown evidence that their view is incorrect, will typically agree that and say, yes, I'm wrong. But he never seems to do that. He just digs in deeper. Yeah, I, see, lawyers represent a particular position. That's what they do. So they may represent somebody who's guilty of murder, who they know is guilty of murder, but that's not their charge. Their charge is to do everything they can to get them off or to get them the least possible sentence. So that's, so that's their charge. And I think the way he sees this is his charge is to scare people about vaccines, period. And if, mm. even if evidence contradicts him again and again and again, this is his charge. He's representing this, this, uh, this killer. The killer in this case is viruses and bacteria. So if everyone listening, you can't trust anything RFK Jr. says about vaccines. So think about whether you would trust anything else he says. We don't do politics here on this show, but if he's so wrong about vaccines, I think he's likely to be wrong about other things as well. All right, we will put a link to Paul's column in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. 